uh, seems to be taking. So magic. <laughs> this thing was Zoom. They let they let you struggle for a month, and then they then they'll do something. <laughs> well, I, the magic is so funny. I I had the first person pay. I have the little square reader, you know, the card reader. Right. But it, you can tap. I had the first person that um, I said, "Oh, here's here's this. Go ahead and just put your card." And they just reached up like this, and I heard beep beep, and it was the payment sound. And I went, "Well, oh, I just paid with my watch." I went, "Oh, magic <laughs> continues." <laughs> it was a surprise because I hadn't even thought about it, but they had Apple Pay or the credit card on the watch. Right. Let me see what happened to that. Had it. Ah, I, I found it. Fell down behind my books. Um, so as soon as, so since we're chatting about this in front of our audience and they don't know what we're talking about, I'm going to pull it out and uh, let you say something about it. So we've been talking about uh, Jordan's uh, published um, Tarot set. Uh, and Jordan Haggard published a Tarot set, and here it is. Uh, let's see if anybody's going to see it. Background, uh, right? No, I'm going to have to get rid of the, the uh, virtual background for a moment. All right, so here it is. This is uh, Jordan's Tarot set, and I'll hold it up while you talk about it, Jordan. Well, Schiffer Publications, South Tried, self-published in 2008, uh, found me in the lobby of a hotel in 2009 in May at Reader's Studio, put on by Ruth Ann and Walt Amberson of the Tarot School. And I laughed because I, the first time I've been to New York, and it's a little strange when someone's yelling your name across the 10-story atrium lobby in a hotel um, somewhere you've never been. And I was talking to a group of basically tarot luminaries and having a great time. And then I get this big tug on my shoulder or on my elbow. And she said, Mr. Hoggerter, are you fond of not answering to your name? <laughs> and I, I smiled and I said, well, my mom said something about not talking to strangers, except do you have candy? <laughs> I'm an adult, I can take it now. And she said, they tell me like this. Um, and so she walked me around and it was Dinah Roseberry, who, who was one of their editors and walked me around, introduced me to Pete Schiffer, president and CEO of Schiffer Books. And yeah. lo, lo and behold, I put together a 122 page mock-up full color heartbound of tarot children's stories where the cards spoke in the first person, mm -hmm. but it had disappeared a year before. <clears throat> and I didn't remember where or how and, until right then, I remembered um, exactly almost a year from there, from that point. Um, I think the uh, head of the Denver Tarot Tribe had taken it when I went to the bathroom at a Kabbalah meetup. And when I came back, I just didn't notice it was gone I because I wasn't using it currently. I just had put it out. And I think she sent it to Pete Schiffer because they had rejected my proposal in 2007 because they were just all full. They had already filled all their docket. Yeah. Well, he opens his briefcase after we talk, and here comes this purple cover hardbound book. And I went, oh, uh, how'd you get that? He said, I'm not at liberty to say. <laughs> so the person, one of the people in Denver must have sent it to him, but he said, we'd like you to um, take this Tara voice that you have that's probably, you know, 10,000 words or so. And take it up to 60 or 70,000, about a 200 page book using this Tara voice idea. We've never heard this before. And, and he said, you know, anyone else who's done it? And I said, well, Alejandro Jodorowsky has made the card speak. And Isha Lerner worked with kids, which was very much that kind of voice work. But other than that, no. And they said, well, um, how long do you want? And I said a year. And so we signed a contract and I wrote the the book and the big thing that's different about Mysterium is <clears throat> it's really about stay with the image. And it was fortuitous that I met, you know, you and Colleen, you know, years later where that's, that's, a, that's the point. And um, what I did is I made the, 
uh, cards into two two chapter pieces where the first chapter was a short chapter on my take of the card and then say enter the magician or enter the high priestess and they speak to you in the first person and my thought was if the cards are speaking to you and you're staying with the images it's only a matter of two or three chapters until you clap back talk back and that will introduce then your own tarot dialogue so instead of what does this mean it's once upon a time, visual story of the card, the end. So you start telling your own tarot stories from the images. And then any kind of rote meanings and memorizations you have, just inform your intuition to go along with it. But that's emanating from your own creative wellspring, striking chords on your personal imagination right. from the collective as well as your own. So to me, that's where um, the project was both fun and then different, is that it's about tarot voice and literally staying with the image so that if you've never done a reading in your life, um, I'd say the younger you are, probably the easier it is, the more connected you are still to imagery, or if you've, anyone's gotten back to it. Um, if anyone's I'm still connected to imagery, come on, that's not fair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm still young. Okay, so we've been talking about uh, Jordan Huggard's uh, Tarot in the Land of Mysterium, and... Uh, it's available on Amazon, and it is. I think it's also available on your website. So maybe you should put your website into the YouTube um, chat I'm just on and, and also into this chat since we have a mystery guest tonight. I'll and put it here. I'm not on the YouTube chat here. I'm on just this one. Let me pop it in here. Would you mind copying and pasting? Okay, I'll put it on the YouTube chat. And, and actually, <laughs> just go to... Just go to Amazon and type in Jordan Hoggard and then Mysterium because I've put my website up. I've changed the link. So instead of buying it from my site, the link redirects you to the Amazon. Okay. So I, I, anyway. I sold out of all mine. So I, I just linked it over to Amazon. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. So once again, we've been talking about Jordan's uh, tarot deck. Uh, Tarot in the Land of Mysterium, and he's available on Amazon. And um, thanks for the mention. And you're quite welcome. Appreciate it. And, uh, Jordan and I have done a lot of work in the Tarot over a couple of years now, especially. Um, and you can find on this YouTube channel uh, a complete discussion of the whole deck. Uh, in great detail, actually. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we talked about it for an entire year. So it's, um, we did a very thorough job of it with several of our friends. And um, so we urge you to take a look at it because it's my position and I may be wrong, but it's my position that Tarot is a uh, midway stopping point between uh, just normal life, which includes uh, getting together with a friend for coffee or beer, uh, which is one kind of psychotherapy and, um, and, uh, and psychotherapy itself with a professional um, psychotherapist, a psychologist that you have to pay under $50 an hour or more uh, to get their attention. Uh, but a tarot reader um, can help you also. And uh, they can do the things that you need to have done in order to, um, in order to get out of your funk if, you're, if you happen to be depressed or something like that. Um, well, I might mention too that a lot of people shy away from tarot for one of two reasons. One, that, oh, that's the occult. And two, that, oh, there's so much to learn. I, I don't have time for that. And my, my thought on both of those is it's really about imagination, enhancing your decision making uh, from the heart of the matter rather than uh, beating the heart of the matter out by too much philosophy and logic. So it's, it's a mythological uh, leaning tool that I think just as an ally so that if you've ever been to an art museum and gotten tingles looking at your favorite painting or 
looked up in tr a tree and saw Einstein's face or, you know, something like that. If you've ever had any imagery influence you in your life, literally, if you just open a deck and just gaze into the image, um, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, and usually something will be there for you. Hey, Susan. Hey, Brian. Yeah, I finally figured out uh, when you guys do this. Nice. Good to have you. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a mystery guest here also who is certainly welcome. And I have given to our um, mystery guest talking permission. Uh, so you don't have to come into the panel and be seen on YouTube, uh, which you are not seen on YouTube at the moment. Uh, unless you start your video. Uh, but if you wish to talk about something that we are talking about this evening, you're welcome to uh, speak and uh, we will respond. Okay, so I'm, uh, we're gonna start tonight with uh, paragraph nine, uh, 309. <clears throat> and uh, you're gonna have to be careful to watch the bouncing ball here because this is, uh, is, this is a, a, uh, a paragraph, there are a few paragraphs here where uh, Dr. Young does a few head fakes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have to be sure what you're talking about, but I'll read 309. <clears throat> so Brian, do you have, uh, you have this book? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, good. All right. So um, <clears throat> paragraph 309. And so I, I sold this as uh, the ideal picture of a man. Well, okay. Uh, so the persona, the ideal picture of a man as he should be is inwardly compensated by feminine weakness. And as the individual outwardly plays the strong man, so he becomes inwardly a woman, i.e. the anima, uh, for it is the anima that reacts to the persona. <clears throat> but because the inner world is dark and invisible to the extroverted consciousness. Um, and because a man is all the less capable of conceiving his weakness or weaknesses, the more he is identified with the persona, the persona's counterpart, the anima remains completely in the dark and is at once projected so that our hero comes under the heel of his wife's slipper. Uh, if this results in a considerable increase of her power, she will acquit herself none too well. She becomes inferior, thus providing her husband with the welcome proof that it is not he, the hero, who is inferior in private, but his wife. In return, the wife can cherish the illusion, so attractive to many, that at least she has married a hero unperturbed by her own uselessness. This little game of illusion is often taken to be the whole meaning of life. Okay, do anybody want to talk about that? Well, the last sentence applies to this paragraph. I mean, that he's really talking about the machismo male, which is a duck and cover for absolute terror of a child inside in a grown man's body. Right. Um, the duck and cover of the you know, if I like you and you say one thing and mean another, it's irony. If I don't like you, you're a liar. You know, I mean, so it's the kind of thing where I think this, I, I'm glad he ends it up with this little game of illusion is often taken, be, taken to be the whole meaning of life because this little game of illusion is a really unhealthy relationship that he's speaking to in this paragraph. I mean, Brian, I mean. Well, us. but it's also the basis of many a sitcom. Uh, I, love, really? I love Lucy comes to mind. Yeah. yeah. I mean, honestly, I think that that stuff is funny. I mean, it's Shakespeare too. There's all sorts of, you know. Right. Well, what is uh, funny? Let's talk about the the secret of humor for a moment, right? You mm -hmm. want to speak to that, uh, Brad? Well, I, you know, I just think it is, uh, <clears throat> it's always... And, you know, I think smiling, there's a little aggression there because you're baring your teeth. But, you know, I think that there, there's this recognition that somehow oblique enough to not hurt 
but uh, direct enough to at least uh, hit a mark. Mm -hmm. Right, well, right. So, yeah. so to me, humor is about um, triggering something in your unconscious. Okay, mm -hmm. in, in other words, um, the the comedian says something that you recognize to be true, but it's in your unconscious, and uh, <clears throat> and so it you you can't resist it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, no, that's. To, that's my basis of humor too. I call it the lightning strike because they say something and then out of nowhere, these two things come together mm -hmm. and clash that are actually, I mean, Freud would say, you know, minor hysteria. If you listen to Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. Um, but you know, it's the laughter is minor hysteria. You're surprised, you're startled, but you're not in danger startled. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not a, a, a fear it's it's but there's the same kind of sensation because except that, you know someone doesn't have a gun to your head or anything like that right so and it's I, not go ahead i was just gonna say well and it's not slapstick this sort of interpersonal man woman where the woman is kind of a trickster um who somehow is playing around this this uh i don't know this kabuki theater of of masculinity um I think that there's also kind of a recognition that as much as I don't want to admit that that's true. There's a, there's a, there's a sort of a mirroring effect. It's like one, I can, I, I can kind of predict how this is going to go. Mm -hmm. There might be some incongruity, but there's some kind of recognition of like, that is actually a thing. And that's some of its humor. I think. I think sure. so. I think even when he says, you know, that, that at least she has married a hero unperturbed by her own uselessness, what happens is then she's really not telling him about his own uselessness. And she, she's letting him play that, you know, little Halloween mask of mm -hmm. I'm a hero on the journey. And no, you're not. You're going just going to the office. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you're so, in uh, you're in so who battle. who? Who okay. is it in current affairs uh, right now who is the poster boy for this um, persona feminine uh, feminine reality? Besides Trump? Besides yeah, Trump? Be besides Josh Trump, Holly? yeah. Josh Hawley? Yeah, Josh Hawley. Oh, no. Yeah, because you see him Perfect. in the castle, he's hollying ass to get out of there. No. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing what? I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. He's hollying ass to get out of there. Well, it's, a, it's a new <laughs> verb. Run across the hallway out the door, for fear for his life. Right. So, After doing this, you know, just a couple hours before, raising his hand. Right. So, see, he's a perfect poster boy for this, which demonstrates that uh, the truth to my father's old saw, the, the hard-boiled egg is always yellow inside. And um, have you seen the cartoon with him where he's tapped the voice to merge in the toilet with his hand? So much for that career. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can say that I married the wrong woman to be bolstered by a weak wife, <laughs> yeah. uh, which means uh, my, my feminine recognized her. Uh, strong side, uh, mm -hmm. her, her mm -hmm. masculine. I recognized her animus, and I wanted a piece of that. She's she's definitely not a shrinking violet in my life. Yeah, no, and well, and she's straight up, and but with humor. And I think that's the one thing that I find so attractive about humor is it's the Cirque du Soleil. It's not even a gymnast. It's someone is playing with an idea way past not taking it personally. You can tell this expert skill in play, almost like a lioness batting out her cub's back legs and they fall and they fall and you laugh. And then one day, about a year later, that involves dinner when they bat the legs out of an antelope. And so I find that that's to me a lot of what I respect about people who can operate with a complex subject with humor because it's even beyond Einstein's, you know, explain, explain it to the four-year-old or the street sweeper. It's that you're able to take it so far that in a sense, you self-deprecate the idea. You can make fun of it in the expression of it 
so that instead of inciting conflict, you end up inciting dialogue um, with that truth, I think, because I was it Oscar Wilde, you know, if you're going to tell people the truth, make, make them laugh, mm -hmm. otherwise they will kill you. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, that, that's right. And, and um, well, or, or they'll, they'll fold. I mean, the way this came right. up for, for me the first time in my life when I was 10 years old was when I was in the fourth grade and I was going to uh, this country school and this, uh, the country school had three classes in one room. Uh, and um, the, um, so we had the fourth, fifth and sixth grade all in the same room and the, one teacher for all three grades. And so uh, we had one drinking fountain and we had a, you know, 10 minutes or so. So every morning when we could all go to the drinking fountain, but we had to line up and this one fifth grader who was a year older than me, he was a farm kid and he was pretty big and strong. He was much bigger than I was at the time because he was growing and I, I was still kind of little, I guess. And, um, you know, he, he kept shoving me in this line for the drinking fountain. And I, so I told my dad about it. And he says, well, don't worry about him. A hard boiled egg is always yellow inside. So the next day I was in line and he was doing it again. And I said to him, well, my father says, says this. And all of a sudden he just wilted. He just um, caved and became a, a good friend of mine for the next year and a half that I was in that school. So mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's interesting that response too, especially with the truth, the hard boiled eggs always yellow inside that I find too, I mean, I find it being, you know, my clients are random people who yeah. show up, you know, yeah. on, on a vacation um, these days. And um, do you get, I call some people the poker pester tortures and what it is, they come in and they're grainy and salty and they're, they're, almost to the point of rude, except it's, you can tell the really just caustic hilarity you're oper operating with. And well, you know, when you're younger, you take it personally, you just got interviewed out because you, you, you respond, you react and you clap back. And I just, I always have some, I don't know what I say. Like, well, you know, I'm not a clear fraudulent. That's not how this works. Yeah. And, <laughs> you, know, you know, that, that kind of just, you know, takes out the crystal ball and all that. But well, that's their interview technique. And then they're just looking to see what you're made of. So like with him, maybe not so much as a kid, but once you clapped back in a way that he respected and felt, then, oh, interview is over. Let's be friends. I mean. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's go on. Uh, Jordan, uh, these, these paragraphs tie into one another, so we should keep going here. Well, three, paragraph 310. Just as for the purpose of individuation or self-realization, it is essential for a man to distinguish between what he is and how he appears to himself and to others. So it is also necessary for the same purpose that he should become conscious of his invis invisible system of relations to the unconscious, and especially of the anima so as to be able to distinguish himself from her. One cannot, of course, distinguish oneself from something unconscious. In the matter of the persona, it is easy enough to make it clear to a man that he and his office are two different things. But it is very difficult for a man to distinguish himself from his anima, the more so because she is invisible. Indeed, he has, he has first to contend with the prejudice that everything coming from inside him springs from the truest depths of his being. The, in quotes, strong man will perhaps concede that in private life he is a singularly undisciplined, but that, he says, is just his weakness with which, as it were, he proclaims his solidarity. Now, there is in this tendency a cultural legacy that is not to be despised. For when a man recognizes that his ideal persona is responsible for anything but ideal anim, anima, his ideals are shattered. The world becomes ambiguous. He becomes an, ambiguous even to himself. 
He is seized by doubts about goodness, and what is worse, he doubts his own good intentions. When one considers how much our private idea of good intentions, good intentions is bound up with vast historical assumptions, it will readily be understood that this is this that it is pleasanter and more in keeping with our present view of the world to deplore a personal weakness than to shatter ideals. Right, oh, so uh, a good personal um, weakness that Americans often show uh, is that they th think that America is the best country in the world. <laughs> and all you have to do is a little traveling in the world and you see how silly that perception is. Um, mm -hmm. Well, it's, it kind of goes along with the joke, you know, like America has, you know, this big star and uh, kind of like the Texas flag, it becomes a Yelp rating. You know, it's just only one star. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. Okay, so I was asked what paragraph we're on. We are on paragraph 310. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I am out. I'm out. You know, I, I think what's interesting is in keeping of their present view, more pleasant, it's more pleasant to deplore a personal weakness than to shatter ideals. And I think certainly it is pleasanter, but I don't think that's in any way solid for development simply because it, I think there's a little bit of a Protestant, Catholic, Western shaming behavior that's going on there with original sin in this last sentence because. To me, understanding your weaknesses, I don't want to delve on what's wrong with something because then I'll never get anywhere. I mean, you, you end up trying to make bread with all the chaff that you blew off in the wind. Right. But at the same time, what caused that chaff to come off is a weakness. And that where the connective tissue uh, breaks down, so to speak, and an idea and a personality trait, a neurosis, um, a gimmick, um, any of that, I find understanding the weakness, but without a sense of shame for it and making shame walk the plank where then back to our original conversation with the humor, if we can go, yeah, well, that's just me. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, and you're not you're not running from it. Then the weakness can be informative, I think. Mm -hmm. And also you can you can steer away from it at the the right times, as it were. Right. Now, I just let me just mention that someone in response to my giving the MailChimp connection apparently did sign up. And so if you are interested this evening in joining this panel, uh, you know, I've already sent out the notice for tonight. But if you will write me at this Gmail address, I will. Uh, I'll watch my Gmail a little bit, and if I see somebody coming in that says he, wants, he or she wants to join our panel tonight, um, I will uh, get you already sent out the, the notes. links. Uh, who was that? I think there was just an echo on, on your audio. Yeah, for some reason. Okay, uh, so I, uh, I'll check my email in a couple of minutes and uh, maybe every 15 to a half hour after that. And if you, um, if, you, uh, if you want to join us this evening, write me an email right now and I will uh, forward to you tonight's notice so that you can uh, connect to us here. Um, and I think that's just an offset. I think it's more simply what I was saying was, I think being occasionally shattered is extremely effective and positive and actually necessary for transformation and development. Yeah, and I, I even at my age, and I'm 75 now, so it's um, no spring chicken, uh, but um, even I, you know, there's this old story about how a 40-year old man is walking across campus and all the co-eds uh, think he's invisible, <laughs> right? So um, certainly in our play this in June, 
uh, we were talking about how in psychology, sometimes others see us uh, better than we see ourselves. And when the, when the curtain of self-deception falls away, um, you know, that we see ourselves as we are seen in that moment. And that sometimes can be a shattering experience. So every so often I look in the mirror in a, in a right way and, um, you know, in a here and now, what do I really look like way? And so I can definitely fake it from here up, right? So, <laughs> so, so uh, I, can, I can still be attractive to uh, some women, I suppose, uh, if they're old enough. <laughs> uh, but, um, but, you know, when I looked at myself in that play, I said, my God, I'm fat. You know? <laughs> you know, and so that that is a sure shattering experience to, um, you know, shatter your ideals because I think I'm, I'm this, um, you know, handsome leading man in the play oh. type thing, and <laughs> and then I I look at the video of it and I say, whoa, who, who brought that guy? In? <laughs> right? Yeah. It, it, it's funny you say that, you know, I mean, I saw my stepmother for lunch here about a month ago um, and we hadn't seen each other in, well, since last summer. And um, we didn't say anything about it at all last year, but she walks up and she kind of went like this, you know, in my stomach. And she goes, you used to work out six days a week, two hours a day, twice a day. Um, what's this? Where'd this come from? <laughs> So, so I'm with you. I kind of tend to turn around to the that thing back there, uh, <laughs> the rack, as you called it. You know, what's that rack you have back there? <laughs> yeah, and I, I was looking at the Pope uh, today when he was doing his uh, little talk to the to the um, to the First Nations of Canada, and. Um, you know, he when he's sitting in his chair, of course, in his in his white uh, cassock, he's he's quite an impressive man. But when he stands up, uh, I notice that he too has quite a caboose. <laughs> 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 uh, but anyway, well, have um, you seen, have you seen this um, this cartoon? No. All the duck, all the <laughs> And the thought is, the thought above is, God, I hate projection. And and the thing at the bottom is, you know, the duck talking, ah, oh, yes, Mr. Frischberg, I thought you'd come. But which of us is the real duck, Mr. Frischberg, and not just an illusion? illusion. <laughs> <laughs> and up here, God, I hate projection. He yeah. thinks. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, so uh, the fire has asked which site, but I don't know where that question comes from. Hmm. Uh, which site? Uh, well, it's a maybe. Zoom call. Yeah, we're we're on a Zoom call that's being live streamed onto YouTube. Uh, if, Very derivative. Yeah, it's indirect. But <laughs> so if you want to be here with us, then you have to be on the Zoom call, and then. You will be also projected onto the yeah. onto the YouTube stream, <laughs> and, and and everything is on the Carl Jung Depth Psychology Reading Group page. So, uh, so Brian, do you want to go for it with uh, paragraph three eleven? Yeah. All right, <clears throat> but since the unconscious factors act as determinants, no less than the factors that regulate this life of society and are no less collective, I might just as well learn to distinguish between what I want and what the unconscious thrusts upon me as to see what my office demands of me and what I myself desire. At first, the only thing that is at all clear is the incompatibility of the demands of coming from without and from within with the ego standing between them as between hammer and anvil, 
but over against the ego, tossed like a shuttlecock between the outer and inner demands, there stands some scarcely definable arbiter, which I would on no account label with a deceptive name, conscience. Although taken at its best sense, the word fits that arbiter very aptly indeed. What we have made of this conscience, uh, Spittler has described with unsurpassable humor. <laughs> Hence, we should strenuously avoid this particular signification. We should do far better to realize that the tragic counterplay between inside and outside, depicted in Job and Faust as the wager with God, represents at bottom the energetics of the life process, the polar tension that is necessary for self-regulation. However different, to all intents and purposes, these opposing forces may be, their fundamental meaning and desire is the life of the individual, they always fluctuate around this center of balance. Just because they are inseparably related through opposition, they also unite in a media, mediatory meaning, which willingly or unwillingly is born out of the individual and is therefore divined by him. He has a strong feeling of what should be and what could be. To depart from this divination means error, aberration, illness. I was just looking to see if um, uh, I could find what Spittler found funny. Uh, Paragraph 282, yeah, Psychological look, Types. Yeah, it's paragraph 282 of psychological types. And uh, I don't know that I see any, um, any great humor here, but I'll read it. This is the, the footnote to what we were reading. Okay, and it's uh, paragraph 282 in um, psychological types, which is volume six of the collected works of C.G. Young. Um, I think it's uh, volume six. You better check that. Yeah, volume six. So here's what he says. The lifeline that Prometheus chooses is unmistakably introverted. He sacrifices all connection with the present in order to create by forethought a distant future. It is very different from Epimetheus. Uh, he realizes that his aim is the world and what the world values. Therefore, he says to the angel, Epimetheus cannot resist the temptation to fulfill his own destiny and submit to the soulless point of view. This alliance with the world is immediately rewarded. Uh, and it came to pass that, as, uh, quote unquote now, and it came to pass that as Epimetheus stood upon his feet, he felt his stature was increased and his courage firmer and all his being was at once one with itself and all his feeling was sound and mightily at ease. And thus he strode with bold steps through the valley, following the straight path as one who fears no man with free and open bearing, like a man inspired by the contemplation of his own right doing. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because his own of right. his own right doing. Ah, right. Yeah. yeah like a man the, inspired by the contemplation of his own right doing. Yeah, and Prometheus stealing fire and then having his liver continually pecked by an eagle was was not in the quote unquote office of his duties. Um, <laughs> duties of right. office. He he kind of like little went a little off, you know, out 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 from school, so to speak. Okay, there's a little more here in the next paragraph. He has, as Prometheus says, bartered his soul for the P's and Q's. He has lost his soul to his brother's gain. He has followed his extroversion. And because this orients him to the external object, he is caught up in the desires and expectations of the world, seemingly at first to his great advantage. He has become an extrovert after having lived many solitary years under the influence of his brother 
as an extrovert falsified by imitating the introvert. This kind of involuntary uh, simulation dans la caricature uh, is not uncommon. Uh, his conversion to true extroversion is therefore a step toward truth and brings him to just rewards. Whereas Prometheus, um, through the tyrannical claims of his soul, is hampered in every relation to the external object and has to make the cruelest sacrifices to the service of the soul. Epimetheus is armed with an effective shield against the danger uh, that most threaten the extrovert, the danger of complete surrender to the external object. This protection consists in a conscience that is backed by the traditional right ideas uh, that is by the not, not to be despised treasures of worldly wisdom, which are employed by public opinion in much the same way as the judge uses the penal code. This provides Epimetheus with a protective barrier that restrains him from surrendering to the object as badly as Prometheus does to his soul. This is forbidden to him to, to this is forbidden him by his conscience, which deputizes for his soul. Uh, when Prometheus turns his back on the world of men and their codified conscience, he plays into the hands of his cruel soul mistress and her caprices. And only after endless suffering does he atone for his neglect of the world. Okay. So... Well, I think what's interesting, um, I think that goes back you know, into this paragraph where related through opposition, they also unite in a mediatory meaning. Um, it reminds me of doing an astrology reading with someone who's still in the place where an opposition is two different planets that are opposed directly across the chart instead of an opposition and a more mature uh, person where it's, they have a clear view across the table of their dance partner that is absolutely different and doesn't need to agree, but needs to come together both and rather than a win or either win or lose. Um, whereas Prometheus is the both and with his soul. It's deep and it's depthful and it's going to um, basically open the passage for the rest of his life. Whereas Epimetheus, you know, is all too pleased with his self rightness which is you know he's going to be up on his high horse and easily toppled so to speak because there's a superficiality rather than a substance generating his persona um, hmm. i don't know it feels like prometheus prometheus has the sub the surface generated by the substance and epimetheus has the superficial persona that's a shell that's around the substance, particularly hiding his soul in the imitation of the introvert, as it were, and the introvert not being himself, being his brother, even. So even a little confused within, if that didn't yeah. wander off too far off the. Somewhere. Right. Okay, so there's been a little bit of confusion, maybe on uh, the. YouTube chat about what book we're talking about. And this is the book, Two Essays on Analytical Psychology by C.G. Young. It's volume seven of the collected works of C.G. Young. And uh, so- Yeah, Skip's last reading piece was just from psychological types to open right. up footnote number four uh, that Young called into paragraph number 311. Correct, right. Okay, so we're up to 312. I guess it's my turn to read. Is that right? Yep. Okay, <clears throat> 312. It is probably no accident that our modern notions of personal and personality uh, derive from the word persona. I can assert that my ego is personal or a personality, and it, in exactly the same sense, I can say that my persona is a personality with which I identify myself more or less. The fact that I then possess two personalities 
is not so unremar not so remarkable since every autonomous or even relatively auto autonomous complex has the peculiarity of appearing as a personality, i.e. of being personified. This can be observed most readily in the so-called spiritualistic manifestations of automatic writing and the like. The sentences produced are always personal statements and are propounded in the first person singular as though behind every utterance there stood an actual personality. A naive intelligence at once thinks of spirits. The same sort of thing is also observable in the hallucinations of the insane, although these more clearly than the first can often be recognized as mere thoughts or fragments of thoughts whose connection with the conscious personality is immediately apparent to everyone. Um, I'll go on here. The, the tendency of the relatively autonomous complex to direct personification also explains why the persona exercises such a personal effect that the ego is all too easily deceived as to which, as to which is the true personality. So, um, <clears throat> You know, obviously Donald Trump is deceived by his person, his own personality. And his persona. Yeah, no, yeah. Completely. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Brian. You're... No, I'm saying and his persona. You know, I think he's yeah. heavily identified. Right. And well, I, saw, I saw a picture of him. I'm pretty sure it was photoshopped. But he's acting like he's, you know, throwing a tantrum. And there's a little girl who has her eyes closed and this, you know, bonnet that her straps over her, her ears. And then um, the little boy on the other side um, has got his mouth just wide open. And, but it, what it is, is that there's a whole hear no evil, speak no evil, or hear only evil, hear no evil, speak only evil, and then see no evil. And so, but he's in the middle going speaks only evil is what they've changed it to. Um, yeah. With the cartoon, it, this kind of you bringing up Trump too reminds me of um, appearance versus reality. I mean, beyond irony, appearance mm -hmm. versus reality in literature. And if I take Trump as that one character of confused, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but then I take the character of Columbo. You want to talk about a personality? But he's not faking anything. He's not generating anything for you to infer. You actually actually have to listen to the substance. He has to open his mouth before you get anything. So it's right. more of a real person personality, just from the character, as it were. Right. He's, Which would be op opposite of Trump. Right. Now that, that's a that's a good example. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Like, a friend of mine. It's like someone's like, oh look, he's lying. And I mean, it was Trump, and his wife said, "Well, well, how do you know?" He said, "His mouth moving." Moving now. Yeah, it's yeah. just. Uh, and Amela says, "I wonder if he's related to Richard Nixon." Uh, well, certainly he is a, a, a um, brother of a type, <laughs> whether they're related or not. Um, well, you get the smart bro brother versus the dumb brother. At least Nixon was trying to do things you know, criminally hiding them um, rather right. than just, you know. Sure. Right. right. Well, just um, because the play school teacher is out of class. Yeah, I mean, for the rest of his life, whether he spends it in uh, Mar-a-Lago or in a two-bedroom flat in Flatbush or in a, um, in a uh, federal prison, mm -hmm. um, it, he won't be able to understand why everybody didn't want things just the way he wants them. Mm -hmm. Literally, <laughs> right. Little Lloyd, Lord Fauntleroy, you know. Yep. I mean, well, Mar-a-Lago sounds a little bit like Quantico, so <clears throat> we'll just rock him in there. <clears throat> yeah, the 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 great counterpart to this is a wonderful movie called Florence Foster Jenkins, uh, which is played 
by Meryl Streep. And I'm going to put that name in the chat because it came to my mind. Um, and the issue with uh, Florence Foster Jenkins was that she was a, a rich kid, thanks to her father. Um, but uh, she, she was just really an average girl, but uh, she kept paying people to say yes to her. And so she, she took all these yes men along, including her husband, who, as I understand it, never had sexual relationships with her because uh, I think she had syphilis. I'm not sure whether, whether it was her or him, but one of them had syphilis. And, uh, but he wanted to be kept around in the manner to which he'd like to become accustomed. So, uh, <laughs> and so, so he, he catered to her every whim. And what she wanted to be was a great opera singer. And um, uh, so she got into the, you know, the auxiliary of the Met and all sorts of things. And, and once a year, she'd hold a big do at her house where she would perform some aria or something and all of her friends would go boop, 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 you know and right. and she would feel good about it and then she started to put on talent shows at the Waldorf Astoria for her friends and again it was the same thing she would perform at these talent shows where she was um, a mediocre performer at best and uh and finally, she wanted to have an opening at the Met, at the Met, and um, or I'm sorry, she wanted to have an opening at Ca Carnegie Hall, mm -hmm. and so her husband um, booked Carnegie Hall for her, uh, for her big presentation, which she came out and did um, in her outfit and everything. And in order to get anybody to come to this performance, um, it was right after World War II, and there were lots of Marines and sailors coming home from the war. So he just went out on the street and handed them all tickets. And so the 3,000 tickets got handed out, and these guys came to this performance, and they were just hooting at her. They, you know, they were... Um, it wasn't very polite. And um, so, as I understand it, immediately after that, she found out that people didn't like her and uh, didn't, weren't in awe of her performances. And she had all these syncophatic um, <clears throat> uh, critics who would say she was wonderful and so on. But there was one critic who got away and the, the husband hadn't gotten to with money. And he published a, a true critique of her performance. And so she saw that and, um, you know, at some, in some way she died very shortly after that. It's not clear how, <clears throat> but, um, you know, it's the same deal where somebody that's wealthy, everybody, um, says that they're wonderful and, you know, nobody criticizes and, and they get way high above their appropriate station in life. <laughs> and then they're in trouble. And uh, so we're starting to, um, we're starting to see the collapse of Donald Trump. Now, I think it's going to, the denouement is not going to be pretty, I suspect. Well, you know, and I think giving all the table time to Trump and Lawrence Foster Jenkins, you know, so much talk about, well, Trump is the product of a monster of a father and a doormat of a mother, and mm -hmm. no boundaries, does anything he wants with no sense of responsibility, actually no self-awareness that anything is cruel, it doesn't matter, he's the only person who exists, mm -hmm. so nothing he does can have an effect on anyone else. If we forget all that, both of them, Trump and Florence Foster Jenkins, and then let's give credit to the Divine Feminine, Liz Cheney, who steps up and says he is not an impressionable little child. He's a 76-year-old man 
who needs to be held accountable and responsible for his actions, period. And she's, she's the divine feminine stepping up with the, the animus piece where she's not imitating a male. This is, this is how a strong woman operates. And I think that's the healthy opposition to the you know, amoebic and you know, non-developed, um, I would say, flagellate of you know, Trump and Florence Foster Jenkins. But I think I would say this too. Uh, he he is he has suffered trauma, and he has suffered splits. And I honestly b- believe he is like this is talking. He's possessed by a complex. The yes. things he does is almost autonomous. I don't know how, and I'm not saying that he isn't uh, that there isn't some deception and maybe playing dumb and so people underestimate him, but when he's in the sort of messianic, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, that controls the crowd, he is in some kind of zone. Right. And I, well, I think it's I really think that's a great point. But it's autonomous complex. Mm-hmm. But it's a great it point. That's why a lot of lead singers and bands, you know, they, they flame out early or evolve and get wise early um, because mm-hmm. I mean, they have such a dopamine rush when the crowd, you know, is energizing them that, you know, that that dopamine rush is, you know, the brain saying, I know you're dumb. So here, let me show you that you need to remember to do that again. Here comes this flood of these happy chemicals. And I bet you you're right. I bet you he's tapped in where that complex has is fueled by that high octane crowd energy where he's basically being rewarded. And right. even if they were yelling at him in the negative, it would still be the same reward now because he's eliciting a response. So it seems now not about the, the product, but just the fact that there is some kind of reaction that he provoked. Um, so I think you're right where, you know, he, he's autonomously being moved along by a complex. And he may have his pieces where he controls it, but he's, he's almost his own right-hand man where the complex is sitting in the throne. Right. Yeah, and, right. And when people finally are saying no to him, like his daughter and the others on January 6th and saying, you gotta call this off. And he's yeah. sitting in the dining room, his complex is clearly in charge. And he's hoping that he'll win through, or at least that complex is hoping that he'll win through. And his persona is, you know, the, the hard boiled egg. Um, right. But, but then, and the next day you see in, in those outtakes that, that com- how that complex was taking over when he was trying to record that. Uh, mm-hmm. that well, I remember, I mean, as an architect, I, I encountered the screaming as a communication tool so many times. You know, whether it was other architects or contractors or it doesn't matter. Um, I'm not going to point it at any part of the profession, but there was such a everything is deadline oriented. So you're always living under trauma. I mean, Mm. that's just what you do. I mean, faster, faster, faster. But don't forget the quality faster, faster. I mean, et cetera, et cetera. And um, and what's interesting is I remember being on a job site. And the other person was clearly actually not in any, I'm not going to say wrong, it wasn't in any way acting on the benefit of the project. And, but he was screaming. And I mean, he was just yelling. And sure. I just leaned in and said, you know, I hear you going to 11, but you're not a professional singer. So be careful. You might damage your voice. Yeah. And I laugh though. Now I didn't realize what I was tapping into, but it was the, you know, all hard boiled eggs are yellow inside, which appeals to the shame. I mean that, and when I just like, don't hurt your voice, there's a compassion piece, but I'm also in a sense, make it fun of, but that kind of thing where they're going to scream until they get their way um, has to be shut down. I mean, you, but the best way is like, I think now is in a well, all horrible legs are yellow inside. Mm -hmm. It's pretty quick and concise there. Right. Uh, Okay. Uh, We did have one sort of taker. Um, 
and I have to send him the, um, um, let's see. Ryan, I really, I really resonate with that. It's as if he is driven by an autonomous complex that is actually a manager part, capital P part, that has have, has had the helm, had the reins for long enough to actually mm -hmm. develop as a whole personality in itself instead of just its original part. Um, mm -hmm. Almost like someone who started when they were 20 and got to go watch you know, part. It's been in control so long that that part is now his, his psyche as in terms of what, how it's presented. Yeah, I think that the other parts of his psyche have involuted and right. I think possessed by it. Mm -hmm. You know, and definitely possessed, but definitely possessed. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, so the, did, the, do, the, do we get a taker? Uh, okay. Yes, but he can't uh, stay. But I, I've sent uh, James. I've sent you the uh, the link in case you want to show up. Uh, it's the same link every week, so it's uh, if you keep track of that one, it'll probably work next week. Although if you've signed up uh, on the on the link above, which I guess I'll put out again, um, uh, this is our Let's see. I think this is it. I hope this is it. So it looks like it got abbreviated a little bit. You know, that possession you're mentioning, I mean, there's there's conflation. That's one thing. But the conflate, the possession is such an intensified long-term conflation that I mean, you want to talk about getting stuck in the tar baby or in quicksand and you can't, you know, even if he had, you know, wonderful intentions to that's, it's almost so long that in a sense, it's, he'll take that to his death. I mean, mm -hmm. Young says that I think earlier. And, um, oh, yeah, there's no hope for Donald Trump. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it, you, uh, it's it, too far it, gone from even a psychological um, therapeutic. Uh, piece. Okay. Yeah, no, there's no hope there. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, to kind of to kind of link back to the earlier couple paragraphs about right. the anima possession and thinking about this, one of the things that occurred to me, you know, is this whole sort of Epstein ring of powerful men and uh, being attracted to a projection of anima that whose uh, what, what, what I say, the tabula rasa for that projection are these immature women and girls. Right. So mm -hmm. to me, it's, it's, it, there's something there about this possessed by a power complex and then sure. having this, you know, you know, very corrosive, destructive, predatory uh, relationship with an anima projection that is immature. Yes. Right, and it, it captures young women, which we see by all uh, all the screaming at Beatles concert, mm -hmm. um, concerts mm -hmm. or what have you. And it takes it makes the innocence of you know the, the young boy you know faking the yawn and the stretch at the movie theater to put his arm around the girl or the boy or whatever, and um, it takes that. That's all cutesy. That's innocent. Um, that's undeveloped, um, mm -hmm. but it takes that undeveloped, but it gets aggressive with it and, and mm -hmm. develops the aggression and the assertion basically on, you know, pick on someone your own size would be the monitor. Right, but probably unable to, probably unable right. to tolerate, you know, a grown woman who can dance circles around you right. while supporting you. <laughs> well, actually, Ginger Rogers. You know, I, I look at her, you watch Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, and you watch the sound off because mm -hmm. you don't get any of the gimmick, any of the movement, and you only get the movement, uh, the movement of the music I'm in. But mm -hmm. you will notice he's not always leading. She's mm -hmm. not always following. There are times you'll notice just this little click. And now he is professionally skiing, being pretty much drugged behind her high-speed jet ski boat. Mm -hmm. And because 
because actually going backwards, if you, the first time you try to jump up and backwards, you will fall down or you get about a quarter inch off the ground and your mind will go, <laughs> no, you don't. Oh, no, you don't. I mean, because it's an unnatural balance. Yeah. It's not the way the knees and the ankles go. And for her to be doing all that backwards and in heels, in heels. Sync, I mean, she's, she's got all these thousands of RPMs more back in these gears and she's dialed in to slow down to synchronize. But there are so many other gears you don't see in the back of the watch that's her dancing, mm -hmm. you know, with him synchronizing. That it's just that same thing, except the positive version of that. Yeah, he, she's definitely towing him around the end for yeah. many times. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's read uh, 314, please. Uh, okay. I think it's my turn. Yeah, mm -hmm. I guess. All right, paragraph 314. Now, everything that is true of the persona and of all autonomous complexes in general also holds true of the anima. She likewise is a personality, and this is why she is so easily projected upon a woman. So long as the anima is unconscious, she is always projected, for everything unconscious is projected. The first bearer of the soul image is always the mother. Later, it is borne by those women who arouse the man's feelings whether in a positive or a negative sense. Because the mother is the first bearer of the soul image, separation from her is a delicate and important matter of the greatest educational significance. Accordingly, among primitives, we find a large number of rites designed to organize this separation. The mere fact of becoming adult and of outward separation is not enough. Impressive in impressive initiations into the quote unquote men's house and ceremonies of rebirth are still needed in order to make the separation from the, from the mother in parentheses and hence from childhood entirely effective. Yet we lack that. What's that? Yeah, we, we, is, we, our culture lacks that. Yeah. 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 We did, not, we did not initiate. I always get on my, you know, rite of passage soapbox. And to me, you know, girls, when, when girls and boys hit puberty, girls begin to menstruate. In one sense, the little girl goes inside and the woman comes forward. She is now able to bear life. Guys, we just get bigger, you know, and we just get stronger and taller. So without an actual enforced rite of passage, it's too all too easy for a culture, especially our culture, that doesn't have even a notion of it hardly, it, for anyone to even leave adolescence. I think 20 years ago, the average adolescence of a male ended at 28, and now it's at death at earliest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I, I will say that the Marine Corps motto of uh, the Marine Corps builds men is exactly right. Oh. I mean, that is a an initiation uh, when you have your first experience in the Marine Corps um, and you either come through it and you're a man or you don't, um, you know, in terms of, I, and I'm talking about just basic training and, and, right. and OCS, but. Well, I've heard people try to, you know, come, no pun intended or actually intended, combat that, you know, the Marine Marines make men by saying, oh, but they break you down and build you back up into something that's not natural. And I said, everything about that was true, except for the last two world words, the mm -hmm. not natural. Shattering is important. I mean, the rite of passage there, the snake, you know, the snakes sheds its skin. And, you know, the, the it yeah, has but to I mean, it's, it, they don't, they don't really break you down per se. I mean, the, oh. no, and that's, but they make you think about yourself in the third person. Well, I mean, there's yeah. a lot of, so I went. I was an enlisted Marine Corps boot camp. Oh, you were. I, I can tell you that twelve weeks of that, and of which probably six are in are in this crisis. Right. And because it's alien, it's it is traumatic. Sorry, but you know these initiations in these primitive cultures or these traditional cultures. These boys are kidnapped and often hurt. Sometimes they're circumcised, you know, and they think they're going to die in order to make this passage happen. And I think the same thing. I mean, you're 
sleep deprived and uh, you know, you're not allowed to eat normally. You're not allowed to eliminate normally. Um, you know, and all all this regimented and yelled at and doing push-ups and side shuttle hops. Right, right. But I but I think that there it it is. It's there's a trauma that then opens, you know, sort of kills the boy, and uh-huh. then you know this other part emerges because there is an archetype there, there, but you'll have to admit brian and uh semper fidelis i'm a marine five. Five. yeah i didn't know you were a marine more power to you sir um but um you have to admit that on the first day the uh, DI or sergeant instructor, whoever it was in, in OCS, it was platoon sergeant and sergeant instructor, and the, at boot camp it was DI. Yeah, drill um, instructor. Yeah. Right, but what they did, they had to on the first day uh, teach you how to make your bed. Okay, so they had to become your mother too, mm-hmm. right? And and they had to, so they there were some feminine things that the mm-hmm. DI has to teach you on the very first day. Now you're you're no longer relying on a woman for that. You have to rely on uh, on a tough man for that. Yeah, and, and there's you know there's the cleaning of the squad bay for you know for field days. Field day, yeah. You know, but it but it's you know this housekeeping thing, and there's even you get taught how to dress. As a man, yeah. yeah as a man. You know, sometimes it's the first time a, a, a young man has learned how to tie a tie. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, it can be. But, and you know, in my my experience was in military. It was martial, and mm-hmm. the thing is, it was training to failure, and then you got to start. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. you know, and literally, I mean, I you, I can't bounce on my feet. All right, let's let's get going. And if I was doing push-ups, you know, and I could do, I think at that point, 500 and I'd stop because I got bored. Well, he would make me go faster to that 500. And then there would be a point where, I mean, I'm going to hurl, I'm about to throw up. And then I do. And then I'm, I'm trying to stop because I know for sure I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. And he goes, Oh, you're not going to die. Just 10 more, you know, and because someone else, you know, this dad character said, said it was okay he told me i'm not so you push out 10 more of course that was just given in now that you did 10 more he watched how fast you did them and so judged how many more to about <laughs> another 200 we're gonna have but until you, you're literally just asleep on the floor in your own vomit you know but i i hear that because the rituals that push that's always in crisis that intensely basically mold the body with fire and, and, well, and that's actually, I think that people that go as far as you're discussing actually go too far. I did mm-hmm. not find that in the Marine Corps. No, and I agree. Sure, all about it. Pardon? But, what, but what's interesting, too, is, you know, there's also tonsure, you know, with the haircut. I mean, mm-hmm. I can grow my hair now because I had my hair plenty right. short, plenty, plenty long years. Yeah. But there's tonsure. Mm-hmm. And and to me, you know, the, the past... The pass and review ceremony is absolutely liturgy. Oh, sure. I mean, I, so I was actually wound up being stationed at MCRD for 18 months, mm-hmm. something like that. And so I'd see the parade like every week and I would watch it fascinated that it's absolutely liturgical. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and of course, I never thought about it in those days. I just... Um, I just was interested in learning the tricks of the trade so I could stay alive in Vietnam. <laughs> that was, well, you know, and it's interesting that was my thing. about you saying, you know, that was going too far. I didn't realize until years later, the two instructors I had, one in North Texas and one in Houston, they had been high school buddies. My first, they were both eighth degree black belt from Korea, but the first one was five foot two. His fingers were about the size of his neck. Mm-hmm. You know, he's this roar kind of little guy. And the other instructor was a little more wiry and more agile instead of being this bull. And what's interesting, though, they went to high school together. And the little one, my first in, in Korea, 
the little one used to steal the other guy's lunch money. He was the bully. So you and your friend becoming friends. Well, come to find out from Han, the other, the second grandmaster instructor, uh, who was his son. So he and I would spar. We were right at the same place. Mm-hmm. One day, 10 years later, he said, oh, man, I can tell you now. I remember my dad and your master Han sitting there with Saki. So what did you get Jordan to do? And so it was a competition to see how far they could push somebody. Right. And, and well, now, now, wait a minute. I, oh, You're talking about an exception. Were those two guys previously in the Rock Marines, the Republic huh? of Korean Marines? Good question. No, actually, they weren't. They were both Olympic footwork coaches for the international Taekwondo team that I think won like 10 years in a row 40 years ago. Or okay, well, that, that, yeah, so that, 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 that is military, a, that's military. Pretty much. That's a di- very different uh, breed of cat, I think. You yeah, know, because uh, l- let me I'll just give you a, a brief explanation of what I'm thinking of here. My regiment had a boundary with the rock marines in vietnam okay so we we were we had one area that we were responsible for and the very next unit over was the republic of korean marines and um what would happen is that people would run to come and be captured by us out (laughs) out of the open area because they didn't want to be captured by the rock Marines. Mm-hmm. And, um, and why was that? Because the rock Marines would skin them. Yeah, okay. literally. I mean, they were, you know, they were a very different kettle, kettle, kettle of fish from the, from the gentle American Marines. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I look back and I might as well have been Nadia Comaneci, not as good as her, but Nadia Comaneci under her coach. Yeah. That that generation of Russian gymnast, gymnastic coaches, it's beyond ice skating and such, which you want to talk about rigor, de rigueur, and if I want to get intellectual about it, but it, when you're when you're training from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m., 7 p.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week, and you think that that's nothing, that's like normal, then something different's going on. You know, and I, I didn't realize. Fortunately, I was young, though. So what did I know? <laughs> yeah, well, what do we all know, of course? Yeah. But, but I, you know, I, I got I, I take a different perspective, Brian, because I got to about, I would say, the sixth week. And I went to OCS, not, mm-hmm. not <clears throat> basic training, but uh, in about the sixth week, we were out on a hike and there were trucks out there and and there were heads you know they were outdoor heads the, yeah. and so on and uh i remember sitting up on a hill and looking all at all the gear and thinking of all the gear in our packs and i turned to my uh, bunkmate of the time and i said you know this is everything i always hoped the boy scouts would be <laughs> my father had been an eagle scout and i couldn't get anywhere near it because when i was scouting age um everybody had had a snoot full okay the guys that were scout leaders in the mid 50s were guys who had been in world war ii mm-hmm. and, and they didn't want to do squat Okay, they didn't want to do anything. So I could never get them past. I could never get them to take me on the five mile hike that would be required to get to second class. So I never made it to second class in the Boy Scouts. But in the Marines, I got to do 10 mile hikes, forced marches, full gear right. <laughs> in, in uh, black, almost black flag weather the um it was tough enough i mean uh the year that i was in the basic school which was a year later <clears throat> they lost four candidates on a hike um mm. and uh we were 
and there were there were the there's this hill trail in Quantico, and it's Hill 200, which means in in the U.S. Hill 200 means 200 feet, mm -hmm. and so this is a so the biggest hill on the hill trail was 200 feet above sea level, and uh, because the Quantico is right on the Potomac River, which is tidal, and so um, not much above sea level, and um, so we would go out as companies on these hikes, and on these hills, uh, in the in the year that I was at the basic school, uh, they had four candidates that fell out, and they didn't realize it until midnight that night, and they realized they didn't have these four candidates, and so they rousted everybody out of the OSCR, yeah, of OCS, mm -hmm. including all the regulars and everybody searching for these guys. They found, finally found them. Um, two were near death due to heat exhaustion and two were already dead. And, oh. and I won't describe the scene any further, but it wasn't very pretty. And, um, and so then when I came back to Quantico as a, as a staff platoon commander, uh, at the end of my, after my Vietnam tour, I, I, I went through OCS a second time, but as a staff platoon commander. And that was even harder because, because there, there was a mandatory 10 minute break every hour, even when I went through OCS, but for the staff, we would have to do the hike. And then during the 10 minutes, we'd have to take the role and make sure we had everybody. And everybody was buddied up and all sorts of things. And uh, in 68, when that incident happened, the, the CO of OCS was relieved for, for allowing that to happen in his watch. Um, but when I came back in 71, uh, holy smokes, the, the rules were so, so much more strict uh, on the staff as well. So it was an well, interesting juxtaposition to see the, see the two. <laughs> uh, but, you know, in our, our society, they're actually operating in locum parentis. Yeah, surely. You know? And surely. so there's, a, at least on the societal level, there's, there's this trust. I'm giving you my kids. Don't kill them. <laughs> Just training. You know, right, maybe they right, die right. In, in combat, but don't kill them right. training. Yeah, and I, I had one candidate that I had to throw out of the program, and uh, I had to put a suicide watch on him that that, that night. We were he was going to have transport back home the next day, but but that night when he was re removed from the platoon and told he's out of here. Um, I had to put a suicide watch on him just to make sure. Mm -hmm. and, um, anyway, interesting no, times. I, yeah, interesting times. And I think what's interesting, I mean, I'm, I'm not military, but it feels to me the intense fire that create created calmness and intensity. You know, I mean, running towards the bullets. Well, one, no, I'm closing the range. He has to be more accurate the closer I get. He can't just, you know, all over the place. But two, I think it's that calmness and back to where we started the humor, where the old Malay proverb of, you know, trees with strong roots laugh and dance in storms. And yeah. you almost perform better because you know where the eye is. You know, you can take a nap in the eye. Um, yeah. But I think it, they, from our three sharing of experiences here, from my perspective, it was that was part and parcel half of how I think I developed some sense of wits. And, yeah, and I think the other, the other half was my dad. And I, I, again, I was too young to know. I mean, Charlie McMurtry, if you know Larry McMurtry, Lonesome Dove, he wrote that book. And mm -hmm. there's a, uh, well, his brother, Charlie McMurtry was the same age as my dad. I think Larry was a little early, older, but they went to rival high schools. <clears throat> so, you know, every so often, Charlie's just showing up for lunch. I didn't know who he was. And one day Charlie said, uh, Jordan, I, 
I'm, I'm really glad I'm not you. And, and, and I looked up and went, well, two of me would be too many. I said something, which wasn't anything other than falling off the ship of where he was going. Yeah. And he said, Oh no, no, it's not because of you. It's because of your dad. Mm-hmm. And, and I said, well, what do you mean? He's pretty cool. And, you know, all of a sudden I'm going into the you know loyalty and I'm defending family kind of thing without even realizing I'm like 14. Mm-hmm. And, and he said, he goes, Oh no, 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 no. You'll, you'll soon learn. But see, I've known your dad since high school. And if he wasn't a poet and he didn't teach Greek tragedy and English and all these things, there's only one other thing on the planet that your dad is qualified to be or do. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, and before I said anything, my dad goes, well, Charlie, what's that? He goes, run a military school. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my stepmother started, I, I, I started turning around like a, I'm kind of getting, wait, you mean every house isn't like this? And because my stepmom was laughing so hard, I, I, I realized, and I remember talking to uh, my best friend, he goes, oh, he must have been totally right. He goes, I have your dad in class. He goes, I love him as a teacher. I wouldn't want him as a dad. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So well, think- one surprising fact, Brian, you have to tell me if this happened at Paris Island. But Oh, I went to San Diego. Sorry. You went to San Diego. Okay. California well, kid. Yeah. Anyway, same sort of difference. Yeah. Um, the at at OCS, thirty percent of the guys who came to OCS to become Marine Corps officers left, left at their own request, and that and that continues to be true throughout. You know, for for the last fifty years, to my personal knowledge, that. Um, you know, 30% of the people that think they can become Marine officers don't make it. And mm. I, I don't know if in, when you were in the Corps, so if, if you- Yeah, well, I'd say in our, my platoon and boot camp, I think there is, I think there's a kid, I would say like a platoon of, I don't know, it's probably 40 of us, mm-hmm. I think. Two didn't make it. One for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and we didn't have any. I don't think we had any injuries, so they I didn't. They didn't wash back to Tasco or anything. Mm-hmm. So I think. I mean, so the attrition rate is not that high, but I thought it was pretty brutal. Um, but I, I kind of think, in an all, all volunteer force, most of us wound up there because we had to. And not in the whole getting getting sent either you go to the Marine Corps or go to jail that was over with. But mm-hmm. but I you know I'm just saying like economically I didn't have anything else to do. Right. Uh, I think I was not alone. Um, you know, just kind of working class kids, yeah. and <clears throat> so I there may have been a bit of being driven like I got to make this work because. Mm-hmm. I don't have oh, else am I, gonna do is he, I find myself here. <laughs> well, <laughs> so if I find myself here, I better make this work. Um, yeah. Well, I think so there's I a lot of that in the all volunteer force, but you know, it's amazing to me that, and it's an ongoing fact, but it's a very reliable statistic that 30% of the people who go to OCS thinking they can be a Marine officer because it's all volunteer, of course, so you right. have to step mm-hmm. up for it. And 30% leave at their own request. Um, I wonder if it's because you're, you know, college educated that you got other options. No, well, possi- possibly. I mean, there were no other options when money. I went through. Pardon? There's easier ways to make money. Right. But well, there were no other options other than to go in the army as a private when I was there. Uh-huh. Right. Oh, uh, because yeah. there there was either the be a marine officer or be a army private, yeah. and and uh, that was quite an incentive to succeed. Yeah. And yet still thirty percent left. Oh, per, interesting. You know, prefer well, Brian. To, I think you hit the nail on the head with the word brutal, and then Skip, you brought in attrition. I mean, I I look at medical medical med school, law school, and architecture school. Mm-hmm. I mean. 
my my freshman architecture class had 444 people. Second year, we started with 187. After five years in our thesis, we graduated 23. It was less than 5%. Yeah. And there were statements of professors better fail a lot more in this junior year or parents are going to start suing because they would feel they strung their kids along. Mm-hmm. Then, you know, you get into a five-year program, three and a half years in, and all of a sudden, you know, they're failing out because they're basically being tortured. Um, mm-hmm. I will say this about, so in medical school, I also did that. And this is a pretty good statistic. The attrition rate in medical school is very low. Hmm. And I'll tell you why. Why? Because the investment per medical student is extremely high. Mm -hmm. So it's, I I think there's more, you, you, you get more hoops to jump to get into med school. Right. Mm -hmm. You do. That's true. Than, than to be a lawyer. And I would say the, the attrition rate in, in, in law school is high. That's my yeah. understanding. Yeah, it's about but a it, third. Yeah, but it's not in med school. They almost can't afford. And if somebody's struggling, they try to get them through. Because mm-hmm. that's a seat that somebody else could have had, you know. Yeah. So the attrition rate in med school is low, at mm-hmm. least in the, the top tier schools anyway. Yeah. I don't know about the lower tier schools, but hmm. well, I um, I have a friend who, at age forty four, went to medical school, uh, mm-hmm. and he went to um, Seba in the in the Netherlands Antilles for medical school uh-huh. for two years, and I don't think anybody dropped out of that. I, I think you know those those were people that were highly motivated to succeed and, he, and you know he had a wife and a daughter at that time and they had set aside enough money for him to go through med school so um, and uh, so he actually um, he became a licensed doctor at age 50 mm-hmm. amazingly um, I was 45 mm-hmm was my midlife crisis to go to med school. So. I, I, I love it when you said that several weeks ago. It's like, nice. Yeah. <laughs> or That's dumb. It. Well, I mean, I think the midlife crisis is somewhat of a myth because I think really what it is at that point, it's now your responsibility to generate your own rite of passage to birth the rest of your life. And yeah. I think like, you know, I, I laugh that I got the sports car in my early 30s. Um, but so... Everyone said, oh, you're not going to live long. I go, no, no, no. This is a third life crisis, not a half life crisis. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I, unfortunately, for a lot of doctors, uh, being a doctor these days is, is not as well paid as it used to be, or it's mm-hmm. not. Um, yeah, I'd say compared to the rest of society. Yeah, there, there are, again, easier ways to make money. Yeah. If you want to, if you want to get rich, don't become a doctor. Right. <laughs> There are you know, right. So reading on, reading on. Okay, so uh, Brian, why don't you take up three fifteen? Just as the father acts as a protection against the dangers of the external world, and thus serves his son as a model persona, so the mother protects him against the dangers that threaten from the darkness of his psyche. In the puberty rites, therefore, the initiate receives instruction about these things of the other side so that he is put in a position to dispense with his mother's protection. Uh, yeah, I, I believe that. And, uh, it's much more true in, in uh, primitive tribes where there were, you know, the they say with the Maasai, they take them at age 13 and they stick them out in front of the tribe with a spear and they have to face a lion uh, attacking them. And, uh, you know, they learn what fear is. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. But if you don't have the, you know, if you don't have a good enough uh, mothering, if you will, uh, you know, you can't really make this passage yeah you know it's sort of it's it it has to be in place in order to to 
to have anything die away to then be reincarnated as the adult. Right, right. Um, I think that's a good point with a good enough mothering because you have to then be able to not have to ask permission in any situation, decide not just for yourself, not even think about deciding for yourself. You just do what you need to do. I mean, you, you become that parent rather than, oh, I'm deciding for myself. You turn and you are autonomously maturing. At that point, you're not mature, but you're maturing and you realize that it, the onus is on you for everything you do or don't do. Mm -hmm. I mean, and a good mothering will show you, you know, value and the good fathering or, will show you the consequences and dangers of different sets of values. Mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. But you have to have this core. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. My father just... Uh, let me do things, but he never went and cheered me on and never showed me the way. I had to find it for myself. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but on the other hand, I think I cut loose from my mother about the time I went to Japan as a high school student. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was living on the Japanese economy and I had to ride a train for an hour every day to get home, I, I had a bus that would pick me up in the morning, but in the evening I had to get home on my own. <laughs> hmm. And, you know, that was quite a, quite an education over a three year period, um, especially in those days, which were shortly after World War II. So there were the uh, cathedral of, Bo uh, of Yokohama was still in rubble, for example, at that point. Hmm. And, um, and a lot of other buildings. So uh, my school had been the only building left standing after World War II in Yokohama because it was a hospital. And so mm. in, the, in the school building, we got between floors on ramps because the ramps were built for the hospital. Mm -hmm. right? And um, so that was just, always interesting but anyway let's read on um uh 316 did you did you read um yeah i just read a short paragraph I can okay. read it again. let me read it the next uh, the modern civilized man has to forgo this primitive but nonetheless admirable system of education the consequence is that the anima in the form of the mother amago is transferred to the wife and the man, as soon as he marries, becomes childish, sentimental, dependent, and subservient, or else truculent, tyrannical, hypersensitive, always thinking about the prestige of his superior masculinity. The, la the last is, of course, merely the reverse of the first, the safeguard against the unconscious, which is what his mother meant to him is not replaced by anything in the man's education, unconsciously, therefore. Uh, his ideal of marriage is so arranged that his wife has to take over the magical role of the mother. Under the cloak of the ideally exclusive marriage, he is really seeking his mother's protection and thus he plays into the hands of his wife's possessive instincts. His fear of the dark, incalculable power of the unconscious gives his wife an illegitimate authority over him and forges such a dangerously close union that the marriage is permanently on the brink of explosion from internal tension. Or else, out of protest, he flies to the other extreme with the same results. I think this paragraph counterpoints the last part of the last paragraph sentence because here there's the you know the the wife is the mother substitute but in paragraph 315 so that he is put in a position to dispense with his mother's protection it feels the the two different pieces whereas there's the the wife as wife and the wife as wife mother between the two paragraphs and uh, and I think it's interesting that he goes through the, you know, all the rites of passage in Aboriginal and primitive cultures that that do service to to note the natural quality of both of those. 
-hmm. but that the able ability to, to dispense with the mother's protection becomes important. Mm -hmm. And have a break. Yeah. For, for a new beginning. Yeah. Well, yeah. it was certainly important for me to leave Japan and go to college um, and uh, to have a traumatic experience early in college, which was an uh, auto accident in, at Thanksgiving time of my freshman year. Um, uh, fortunately, I was not driving, but one of the boys in the car was killed. And, mm. and um, that was quite a trauma. And um, I, had a, I had a professor who got me through it to his great credit. Um, and um, <clears throat> he was uh, he was quite a man. Um, he had well, been he had been, uh, just a just a little side note. This professor had been uh, NROTC midshipman at Duke during the war, and in 1944 he had the distinct different experience of being on a hundred foot yacht where they were doing a summer training with the NROTC and he was sunk by a, a, a German U-boat three miles oh. off the North Carolina coast. Wow. He had to swim home. <laughs> wow. He literally had to swim home. And, uh, wow, that's... <clears throat> Those water, uh, there were seals then, which means there were great whites then. I mean, that, that's, that's biologically, wow. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't know what, what, the, what the seals thought about the explosions that were going on around him. I mean, like, 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 but ecologically, like, like, like bark, bark ocean seals, not like Navy seals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know you meant bark bark oh, okay, okay. ocean seals, but I mean there were no ocean seals around them because or bark, okay. there were no navy seals around them because those were all deployed in the in the Pacific at that time. But um, anyway, that was that was that professor. He he obviously had his trauma early. Um, well, in your car accident, there's 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 the shattering you know that's that's huge i mean that words almost i mean from over here i i couldn't put words in your mouth for it i mean but that's one of those that's indelible yeah <laughs> anyway uh we got called back for korea as well so hmm. uh, quite a quite a run because he he graduated from Duke in 1945 and went to Japanese language school, believe it or not, in Nebraska, at Doan College in Nebraska, mm. and then went to Japan in the, in the occupation of Japan in 1946. And uh, anyway, I, I had a lot of time with that professor over many years. So. Uh, when, Sorry, when, excuse I was, me. when I was operating a business in Japan about 20 years later and I had a nice home there, um, he took a sabbatical for a summer and my wife had gone home for home leave and taken our children. So he stayed with me <laughs> in Japan. It was, uh, it was very interesting because at that time I was reading MacArthur, the, the story of uh, the Pacific campaign with MacArthur. And uh, he had been in MacArthur's uh, administration of Japan in 1946. So it was interesting to have his perspective on it. Anyway, uh, so who's going to go next? Uh, I'll go 317. Yeah. I am of the opinion that it is absolutely essential for a certain type of modern man to recognize his distinction, not only from the persona, but from the anima as well. For the most part, our consciousness in true Western style looks outwards and the inner world remains in darkness. But this difficulty can be overcome easily enough 
if only we will make the effort to apply the same concentration and criticism to the psychic material which manifests itself, not outside, but in our private lives. So, accust so accustomed are we to keep a shame-faced silence about this other side, we even tremble before our wives, lest they betray us, and if found out to make rueful confessions of weakness, that there would seem to be only one method of education, namely to crush or repress the weakness as much as possible, or at least hide them from the public, but that gets us nowhere. Sure doesn't. <laughs> Sure doesn't get us anywhere. <laughs> uh, this no. creates shadow. Yeah. Yeah. That's a shadow process. Well, you know what's interesting about this? It does. And even, you know, notwithstanding, you know, our experiences, all three of us with basically attrition activities, we could call them <laughs> <laughs> a fair uh -huh. sort of med school, military, etc. Um, I laughed that even a couple of weeks ago, I, um, a client was um, being pretty hard on themselves, but mean to themselves. And I just put my hand up. I said, you know, if being hard on yourself actually worked decades, decades, don't you think it would have worked by now? <laughs> right. and, and, and then she got the make shame walk the plank concept because... Mm -hmm there was this piece of, oh, but I get it because we're all kind of taught to self-criticize for alleged discernment. But the reality is that can only go so far before again, stop worrying about what's wrong. Let's, let's work on developing, strengthening the muscularity of the value. I mean, right, you have to, um, what I tell all my grandchildren as they come of age is that you have to make mistakes and you have to make them as fast as you can yeah. and move on uh, right. be because that's how, how we learn to live a successful life. And boy, have I made a few, but on the other hand, I've also had a, a very interesting life, if not a very lucrative one. <laughs> it's been yeah. lucrative sometimes and sometimes not, but What's the old adage? You know, wisdom comes from experience and experience comes from really bad decisions. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Okay, I'll read on here. Paragraph 318. Perhaps I can best explain uh, what has to be done if I use the persona as an example. Here, everything is plain and straightforward, whereas with the anima, all is dark uh, to westernize anyway. When the anima continually thwarts the good intentions of the conscious mind by contriving a private life that stands in sorry contra contrast to the dazzling persona, it is exactly the same as when a naive individual who, is not, who has not the ghost of a persona encounters the most painful difficulties in his passage through the world. There are indeed people who lack a developed persona Canadians who know not Europe's sham politeness, blundering from one social solace, solecism uh, to the next, perfectly harmless and innocent, soulful bores or appealing children, uh, or if they are women, spectral Cassandras dreaded for their tactlessness, eternally misunderstood, never knowing what they are about always taking forgiveness for granted, blind to the world, hopeless dreamers. From them, we can see how a neglected persona works and what one must do to remedy the evil. Such people can avoid disappointments and an infinity of sufferings, scenes and social catastrophes only by learning to see how men behave in the world. They must learn to understand that society expects what society expects of them. They must realize that there are factors and persons in the world far above them. They must know that what they do has a meaning for others and so forth. 
naturally all this is child's play for one who has a properly developed persona. But if we reverse the picture and confront the man who possesses a brilliant persona with the, with the anima and for the sake of comparison set him beside a man with no persona, uh, then we shall see that the latter is perhaps just as well informed about the anima and her affairs as the former is about the world. The use uh, which either makes of his knowledge can just as easily be abused. In fact, it is more than likely that it will be. Anybody want to comment on that? Mm. It kind of rings a little bit about what uh, von Franz wrote about in the Boer Eterna to me, mm -hmm. but that's more of a mother complex, but I'm, maybe that's inferred in this, some kind of outsized anima. Well, no, that actually, I think that rings true because then the poor eternus, you're dealing with the Peter Pan syndrome. And um, what's interesting to me, this last year, I, I heard it so many times in so many successive conversation, conversations over a couple of weeks and other places that turned me to go, I need to revisit that because I thought, you know, I had a good handle on it, but it was no grow up. You know, I mean, and all that and to take it beyond that. And when I looked at it again, I realized Peter Pan is the enemy. He is the only one who actually abducts children. Mm -hmm. So when I looked at it from, from now and I went, Captain Hook, well, he's got a scar and he's got a hook instead of a hand these are scars born of going out into the world it, these are experiences mm -hmm. and then i laugh because then someone said oh you forgot the patch on the eye i said no 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 no, that doesn't count and they said well what do you mean i said not all pirates lost their eye that was so when you went below deck you could switch it and that eye was already adjusted to the dark that's not an injury that's just smart mm -hmm. so it flipped it up a bit to where the poor Eternus, I think, does apply because Peter Pan is this, in a sense, amoebic psychological lack of development mm -hmm. that's, as I started calling it, oyster spit fresh flesh. You know, one little grain of sand will irritate the heck out of you. Whereas right. someone else is like, oh, it's windy, you know, so what? So I think you're right. I mean, with your reading with the poor Eternus from Bon Franz, I mean, could you go into that a little further? I mean, she would say that the provisional life of the Peter Pan syndrome is really about being kind of lost in, you know, this ill-defined, uh, you know, like in in almost intrauterine sort of, uh, you know, mother complex, just a wash in that, and that the what needs to happen is you need to you need to give up that everything's a possibility, but nothing becomes a reality. Mm -hmm. And so they just sort of float around, uh, you know, maybe surf some, but, but I yeah. mean, they're just sort of, you know, floating through life. They always live in a bachelor pad. They don't get married. They don't have to, but it boils down to, you have to give that up and, and basically uh, lay claim to a particular life. Right and set your feet down on the earth and get in line with everybody else. Right, and what we see in, in our former president is that he never did that. He, he kept remarrying his uh, mother mm -hmm. or, or the woman that he wishes wished was his mother, <laughs> right? Uh, well, yeah, that's a good point because his mom, his, well, I can't say mom, his mother was a doormat. You know, I mean, right. so he, his dad was a monster. His mother was a doormat. So he's he's meeting someone that will not actually test his metal. He's meeting someone that will actually keep him way below any kind of melting point, much less ever get him to a boiling point. You know, mm -hmm. it's like. Right, and there he is kind of blowing through casinos and bankruptcies and mm -hmm. hanging out with, you know, criminals who are like, you know, the mafia is kind of like pirates, right? Yeah. You know, I'm sort of flitting around. And I, I heard an interview with the casino owner 
Um, and he said, you know, it's not that billionaires don't respect Trump as a billionaire, um, whether it's fake or not. He said, all of us have one thing in common. How can you lose money in a casino? You know. <laughs> that takes, he said, you have to really know what you're doing to mess it up that bad. So it was interesting because the lack of business acumen of bankruptcy bailing out probably his tax agreement with the IRS. I mean, if he took a billion dollar loss in 1988 or whatever, he would have till 2024 probably to not make any more payments because he's making payments on that. I mean, he he never he never faced his problems, really. He always had had somebody that was willing to bail him out as long as they got paid as a lawyer. Right. Um, right. Rob Peter to pay and, Paul. To and so, so yearly Chuck Scholl says, it sounds like as an INFP um, male, uh, I'm Whoa. screwed, quote, quote, unquote. Wait, wait, wait. Not- I'm INFP. What is this guy saying? No, he, he just says, it sounds like as an INFP male, I'm screwed. And uh, all right, so do you want to respond to that, Brian? And then... I am fully INFP. Yeah. And so my problem, and there is provisionality in this, my problem is becoming. The yeah. INFP has a problem with becoming. So there's provisionality built into it. Mm-hmm. But... You, part of it has to do, I think, with achieving some balance in temperament. They're just, they're parameters, not, uh, they're not like anchors or destiny or fate. They're yeah. starting points. And I think you'd balance out a little and you too could become less provisional. Right. And, and, and knowing that you're an IF, INFP, uh, is a big step forward because it brings into consciousness what is missing in your mm-hmm. life and how you have to compensate for what what's missing in in you. For example, it was only after I had done most of the things in my business and military career that I learned anything about the Myers Briggs. I didn't start until '87, so I was already um, 41. Um, by by the before I knew anything about uh, Myers Briggs at all, and uh, man, I was just fascinated by it. And I I started to study it. Uh, I read a lot of books about the about the Myers Briggs, and and then. The Marines, then what really surprised me is that the military in all the senior schools I attended insisted on spending a full day out of a, out of a two-week summer training um, teaching the Myers-Briggs. Okay, so, so out of 10% of all the senior schools that I went to as a lieutenant colonel, um, were 10% of those schools was I was Myers Briggs training and understanding how things get done in in the military and who you are and and so on and I am I'm my INTP so I can you know think this out um, maybe a little easier than an F but um, you know certainly the I was very helpful to me, but then I started to observe people who are INTPs, and uh, and I, you know, spotted um, um, well all the recent, you know, famous Marines like Jim Mattis and and Flynn, who was Trump's um, chief of staff for a period of time. Um, you know, those guys are all INTs, um, and uh, they're probably, they may have been Jays, but, you know, um, who's the guy that became Secretary of State? I'm sorry, of the Black Paul Pompeo? Man. Huh? Is that Pompeo? Uh, Colin, Colin Powell. Oh, Colin right. Powell. Colin Powell was definitely an INTP, and, um, and that's a very rare duck, but I started to realize that it was the top generals who were 
in that category. Uh, they were either uh, E or I. Pal was obviously an I. Uh, and, um, but I was realizing that they didn't match the, the mold of most generals. Most, most people who reach general grade in the military are uh, STJ, okay, mm -hmm. STJ. Uh, you know, these are the guys that uh, will say to you, uh, you know, tell me who, who to go kill and I'll take care of it. And you tell them and they go out over the hill or across the sea and then they come back and say, okay, that person's killed, what do I do next? Right. Mm -hmm. and, and so, but the problem for them is that they can't handle the politics and it's the uh, intuitives that can handle the politics. Mm -hmm. And um, also, I think to address that, I mean, I'm an INF, INFJ and I knew I wanted to be an architect at 14. So talk about being screwed. You know, mm -hmm. I've had to my dad for 10 years. I don't want to go. Why do I have to go to high school? I thought I should go straight to college. I mean, mm -hmm. I know what I want to do. Well, that's a defiance streak. That's important. Mm -hmm. stay your course you won't be screwed because being screwed is comparing yourself to other people and the reality is most eyes don't realize three to five percent of the population you won't have a lot of models that you can model yourself with so there's a lot of self-modeling which is a lot of stay the course for almost too damn long stay the course you feel like a failure in a way because you're having to go so decades. And I'll say, I mean, I'm 54 now at 44. Yeah, it's like, no, 46 in 2014. Wait, what's, I can't even add, I'm getting too old. Um, <laughs> 2014 is eight years ago. Yeah, so. Um, Don't talk about old to me. I, I'm, not, I, I'm just I kidding. I'm just kidding. But in 2014, I shut my architecture firm down. Why? Because of imagination and because of the architecture of well-being and because Tarot had paid, kept the doors open for two full quarters, six full months. So the song starts going through my head. Mamas don't let your babies be tarot readers or astrologers or artists and stuff. Make them be architects and lawyers and doctors and such. The thing mm -hmm. is, though, right there, I was staring down the barrel of my tarot looking at my architecture and saying, now, which one of you is the real job now? Yeah. And so if you look at that, I had carried, no one told me this. I had carried an internal bias that my professional tarot reading was not a real job. It was sure. kind of, that would, it was high school. That would be cool if I could do that. Well, until doing invoicing one Friday afternoon, I realized, wow. All I had to do is, you know, it was too much of a hassle that day. So I made it more trouble. I'm like, I'm going to slice and dice it and make it take longer. Well, every architectural invoice would have a comma in the dollars. Very few, if any, tarot readings, unless someone's either paying me for a real estate deal, 3% commensurate with profit or paying it forward, they're not going to have a comma in a tarot reading, you know, mm -hmm. in the price. So it was easy to cut the architecture out. And I realized that because I valued astrology, and architecture and tarot, I was not judging my own polymath team as to who's pulling what weight. They all three were something I valued keeping in the mix. Mm -hmm. But at that point, all three of them turned not to look outward. They turned to being just different ways to look at imagination. So take that at 44, 46, I late bloomer, no. It just, I took me longer. I had more things to develop. And what happened is then, fortunately, I think there was a defiant streak that went through me eight miles wide that partially came from North Texas and probably more so came from my dad. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't get to be chairman of the rank and tenure committee without, and he was also more INFJ kind of thing. And so I think that piece of, you're not screwed if turn to yourself, self-model, and realize that it's rare you're going to find models to help you model. And the problem with that is that's really difficult if you're not 
that's really difficult if you're trying to keep up with the status quo. Like Brian said, you know, to get in line because you can't get in line and feel any sense of accomplishment or value. So, I mean, I pardon going at length, but the, the well, I, I think one, one issue is that in you, that statement. you, you have to be, um, you have to find what you're designed to be. And sometimes that is different at different times of your life. Yeah. Um, you know, for example, when I went to law school after coming back from Vietnam, I never, it never occurred to me that that wasn't a proper decision. Um, and then I got out into practicing law for five years and I said, wow, I, I detest this profession. I really don't like it at all. <laughs> and then I went to business school and I, I succeeded in business. Um, but, you know, I much prefer what I'm doing now. I mean, I, I'm called to do this and I, I wouldn't do it, you know, at, at some expense to me because I don't really ask, I don't push people to make contributions to um, what, I, what we're doing here. Um, and, you know, and that is a cost, but, um, but I'm called to do this. And, and so this is really where my good yeah. place is, just like you, Jordan, with the Tarot, you're called to do that. Right. And I assume, Brian, that you have, you're finding a certain calling in medicine or not. Yeah, but I'm also, I'm also building the path to train as an analyst. Right, right. As a, as a what, I'm sorry? As a junior analyst. Oh, yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah, I'm taking active steps. Oh, you mentioned that a couple of weeks ago. Right, right. Right. And, and how long uh, do you think you have to go to achieve that? Well, as you know, as an overachiever, I think, uh, no, but I think that, uh, you know, the average time is, you know, five years. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I have good genes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I figure I do it for, a little while It'd be better than uh you know because i there's a there's a point at which i really feel like i want to retire from the grind because right. mm -hmm. grind um well i can tell you that male uh union analysts are in dire need in the washington area mm -hmm. okay um and probably everywhere in the country um yeah true oh. um because you know there's a lot of uh, women who are union analysts um but it's hard to find a man and and uh in washington jim um what's his name jim well i i was told by um jim the leader of uh, the young society of washington or the former leader that um his name will come to me in due course, I think. Uh, Jim Hollis. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim Hollis told me that there were only two male union analysts in Washington, and one of them was handling all the gay men, uh, and he had to handle all the all the uh, heterosexual men mm -hmm. in in uh, Washington, and. Um, so I, you know, I don't know what that says, but um, I know that there are quite a number of female union analysts in the Washington area. Uh, still not a lot. There, you know, union analysts are are out there, but they're relatively rare, I think. Um, you know, it's interesting because I remember in brain spotting. I mean, this was a did his comps, licensed cl clinical psychologist in, Phil in Pennsylvania um, for 40 years. And um, I remember I said, well, you know, it's like Jung said this, blah, 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 blah. He, he said, who? And it hit, finally hit home how much Jung has not been in psychology. I mean, it's the Freudian, Freudian. And I was just, I was, I guess, kind of, blessed kind of lucky 
and that this guy had gone his own way into brain spotting and EMDR and other types of more um, experiential psychology mm-hmm. that were actually Jungian. They just didn't study Jung. So there was that, you know, how to learn to live your life, not how to rationalize all the problems you ever had. And, <laughs> you know, it's like my always my joke. Oh, I go to Freud's, you know, studio and I'm going to, oh, lie down and tell me about your mother. I'm like, dude, <laughs> stuck on your mom not me and it's like yeah. <laughs> so anyway. okay uh jordan are you going to read 319 for us yep the man with a persona is blind to the existence of inner realities just as the other is blind to the reality of the world which for him has merely the value of an amusing or fantastic playground but the fact of inner realities and their unqualified recognition is obvious, obviously the sine qua non for a serious consideration of the anima problem. If the extern, external world is, for me, simply a phantasm, how should I take the trouble to establish a complicated system of relationships or relationship and adaptation to it? Equally, the, in quotes, nothing but fantasy, close quotes, attitude will never persuade me to regard my anima manifestations as anything more than fatuous weakness. If, however, I take the line that the world is outside and inside, that reality falls to to the share of both. I must logically accept the upsets and annoyances that come to me from inside as symptoms of faulty (laughs) adaptation to the conditions of that inner world. No more than the blows rained on the innocent abroad can be healed by moral repression. Will it help him resignedly to catalog his, in quote, weaknesses? Here are reasons, intentions, consequences, which can be tackled by will and understanding. Take, for example, the, in quotes, spotless man of honor and standing. Take um, of honor and public benefactor whose tantrums and explosive moodiness terrify his wife and children. What is the anima doing here? Anyone come to mind? (laughs) Yeah, definitely. Okay, uh, Brian, you want to do number 320? We can see it at once if we just allow things to take their natural course. Wife and children will become estranged. A vacuum will form around him. At first, he will bewail the hard-heartedness of his family and will behave, if possible, even more vilely than before. That will make the, the the estrangement absolute. If the good spirits have not utterly forsaken him, he will, after a time, notice his isolation and in his loneliness, you will begin to understand how he caused the estrangement. Perhaps aghast at, sorry, aghast at himself, he will ask, what sort of devil has got into me? Without, of course, seeing the meaning of this metaphor. Then follow remorse, reconciliation, oblivion, repression, and in next to no time, a new explosion. Clearly, the enema is trying to enforce a separation. This tendency is in nobody's interest. The anima comes between them like a jealous mistress who tries to alienate the man from his family, and you're gonna know, oh, uh, and official post of any other advantageous social position can do the same thing. But there we can, under, we can understand the force of the attraction. Whence does the anima obtain the power to wield such an enchantment? On the analogy with the persona, there must be values or some other important and influential factors lying in the background like seductive promises. In such matters, we must regard against rationalizations. Our first thought is that man, the man of honor is on the lookout for another woman. That might be, that might be it might even be arranged by the anima as the most effective means to the desired end. 
Such an arrangement should not be misconstrued as an end in itself. For the blameless gentleman who is correctly married according to the law can be just as correctly divorced according to the law, which does not alter his fundamental attitude one iota. The old picture has merely received a new frame. Mm. Our former president is assuredly a poster boy for this phenomenon. Um, Well, you know, and on the the last paragraph or two paragraphs before with the comment on YouTube YouTube about, you know, the INFP that I'm, oh, I'm screwed. What's interesting is the one who, he, one of those is gold mine the inner world, and one of them is gold mine the outer world, and it's I think a matter of course of how to model yourself to gold mine the both and so that they dance together, but they don't dilute one another. I mean, and and now that's probably pesky idealism in words because there's probably going to be some compromise and some dilution. But the intent being that their integrity of their identities remains intact together, inner and outer, rather than, you know, being stuck inside or stuck outside. Either one of those is incarceration. You know, the, the person stuck outside who has all the wealth, who's never happy, yeah. the stuff inside who's always jealous of the, out, you know, there's always this, why, why don't I get it? But one looking the outside, looking at the inside as enchanted fantasy, well, that's shame and behavior, you know, of something they don't understand. The one on the inside, one will, how do I get that? I, you know, yeah. and well, the, there, yeah, there is the issue of how the how the types interact, and Yuri has raised an interesting point here. He says that I guess I struggle with ESTJ expert expectations of society and how to find a female companion as INFP, just hoping some ENTJ woman will find me attractive someday. Ha ha. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I mean, Yuri, you definitely don't want an uh, INFP uh, woman. if he's saying ENTJ, that's that's asking for a female George Patton. <laughs> yeah, but right, but um, he he definitely doesn't want the same personality type. And so let me that's- address this for a minute. Typically, uh, it's best if you have two of these um, scales the same and two different, or mm-hmm. at least. W- one different uh, because if you have all the same it's too boring and if you have all different if you find that uh, mythical ESTJ woman you're going to be always at loggerheads with her mm-hmm. um, you're you know you're going to be fighting all the time and um, he so says, also too, if you have the same uh, same personality type you're basically dealing with a sister or a brother you're, regardless of age, you're dealing with a fraternal twin. And the problem is then you're going to always be on the edge of tension, of competition, because your brother and sister, you can't leave. You know, our brother and brother, you can't leave. So fighting is not any kind of deal breaker. And so it can be pretty miserable. Or the other hand, it just gets really boring because you don't ever have anything to add to the other person. You both always get it the same way. And that kind of, you know, falls away in, in terms of. Yeah. Well, uh, and one thing to bear in mind, though, these are they, these are polarities. And so there, there's continuum between them. And people score, you know, heavily or less heavily or middle of the road yeah. between the two. So, so I don't know. I'm actually married to an INF woman. She is probably more I, uh, and maybe more F. And some of this is like me adapting to the world, right? Mm-hmm. Can't get. I don't think you could do medicine or survive medicine without getting pretty T and without getting pretty S, right? Mm-hmm. So it's to me, it's like, and then you have choices. 
So, right, but they, then you're, they, and that's by training. That's like in the Marine Corps. If I put my uniform on, then I'm an STJ. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I may be I, but I'm a, I changed STJ um, in that case. So, right. so I mean, I don't, I don't know. It, it, I guess if every, if it, if that, if the Myers Briggs was really like, if you, if you come out a temperament you are maxed out on all the parameters. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't think that people are, and I think that there's, you know, and then the same is true for other people. And so I think there's still, there's still a possibility of a little spark and maybe not so. Yeah, it's, I, I appreciate your, con, your comment of, you know, the T and the J to get through medical school. I mean, in college, I, my girlfriend was in psychology and. I went over and did the Myers Brig, and I was a strong ENFT. Except that summer, not under deadline, I tested INFJ. Well, what's interesting, I look back at that, and I was an extrovert, and I was a T because I was em- emulating my dad. Mm-hmm. But the, the F never changed, and so now the INFJ is so much more synchronous. So it's interesting that. The way the personality developed, my personality developed, or, and or the way I developed it, it seemed to be a natural course of shedding the first and the last letters, the shell of them, you know, first, outer, inner, last, and, you know, algebra kind of thing. And um, how does that come into resonance? And then simply, it can change over time. Yeah. And you evolve, you, know, you cycle through. Yeah, this is an interesting comment here. And Yuri says dating an ESTJ was very passionate, but way too intense, uh, but also very transformative. So, yes, I'm sure it was a, a transfer. <laughs> no, on Thursday we have fire walking, and on <laughs> yeah, if you're gonna have four. Right, in the fire it's yeah like, if you're gonna have four type four types different boy it's uh it, that would be intense yeah. and fortunately my wife my current wife and i are um both ints and we differ only in f and j or f and, i'm sorry j and p and so uh, she's the judging one, and so she may she goes to the grocery store and makes lists, um, and she's oh so happy because Alexa makes a shopping list for us now. Um, but um, you know, I'm perfectly happy to go to the grocery store and just pick things off the shelves. And uh, the re- reason it's good to have me along on a shopping trip is I'm the guy that buys the ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well that yeah i as a j i i learned make sure i eat not at home go out to eat on the way to the grocery store because then one i've spent money so i'm a little more budget conscious mm. and two i'm not hungry so i won't forget the ice cream but i won't get steak salmon and some kind of brie that's triple cream and eight thousand dollars a pound and i mean you know it's so it okay, so, so i guess we've been giving marital advice here but <laughs> in general the the yeah. marital advice is when you're when you're dating don't take a woman who's all the same as you that would yeah. be too boring and yeah. don't don't take one who's all the different aspects because if that happens, you're going to have a very passionate but very in- in transformative relationship, assuredly. <laughs> and uh, if you could stay in the passion, 100% great. But the problem is, in, in, in between the passion, there, nothing fits together. You, yeah, but if you're in, if you're an introvert, uh, as a man, definitely try to find an extroverted woman if you can. Uh, because otherwise you're just going to sit at home and watch television. If you have an extroverted woman, she'll get you out into society, which is a good thing. And, and my wife and I always struggle to have a social life. Yeah. So especially since COVID, but even since then, Mm -hmm. okay. uh, 
Jordan, you want to go ahead with 321. Sure. Paragraph 321. As a matter of fact, this arrangement is a very common method of implementing a separation and of hampering a final solution. Therefore, it is more reasonable not to assume that such an obvious possibility is the end purpose of the separation. We would be better advised to investigate what is behind the tendencies of the anima. The first step is what I would call the objectivization of the anima, that is, the strict refusal to regard the trend towards separation as a weakness of one's own. Only when this has been done can one face the anima with the question, why do you want this separation? To put the question in this personal way has the great advantage of recognizing the anima as a personality and of making a relationship possible. The more personally she is taken, the better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me read this next paragraph because it feels that these two segue. Okay, but I, I just want to note that without my paying attention, we've actually gone over a half hour already. Wow. That's and, why we made so many paragraphs. Right. So <laughs> I was looking down going, wow, we've made a lot of head. Didn't look over it. <laughs> uh, okay, then I won't. Yeah, I think you don't, but why don't, why don't we do it so that we stop before 321, which you just read, yeah. and, and then we'll let you do that next week. Is that? Yeah, well, yeah, let's start with 321, 322 as a couple paragraphs next week. I think that would, yeah, I didn't really, wow, we, yeah, we 323 blew. seems to fit in too. So, so the problem is if we just keep going, we'll be at it all night and um, I have to get some sleep. <laughs> well, I was going to say, we'll be at it all night and then we won't be at it much at all tomorrow in any kind of, you know, good way. Yeah. I'll have to get the helmet with the two. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, well, go ahead. I was just saying, thank you. Yeah. It was an interesting evening. Thank you for being here, Brian. And uh, it's great to know that you're a fellow Marine, Semper Fidelis. Yeah, Semper Fi. Yeah. And uh, so thank you, Jordan. We'll see you on the advanced group in on Wednesday. Wednesday. Uh, I, I realize that I'm reading three books with three different groups. <laughs> right now it's uh, well i was i was looking down at i'm like wow am i gonna no i'm not gonna record the books i'm reading that won't make them go faster it'll just make me more committed to no no i need to go to work it's like, <laughs> three and three a week is plenty yeah okay now there's a few other comments here um it says, says uh, multi-personality is to is to wait it. He says, I like how Ken Wilbur puts it. Our consciousness floats between different stages. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. That's fair enough. And it floats between uh, different types. Mm -hmm. uh, and as, as Brian points out in medicine where uh, he's an intuitive um, feeler he has to work as a sensing thinker as a as a um, doctor and i have to if i'm if i put my uniform on then i have to do a sensing thinker as a marine officer it's interesting and, because when everyone goes to compartmentalize which is philosophizing you know schopenhauer is infinite in his compartment um as is every other philosopher, but mythologically living, it feels to me the psychological concept is liquid glass walls inside, so mm -hmm. that there's not a there's not a blending, but there's not a visual limiting. So you can move through, but you are in distinct things, not getting blurry and amoebic. So that I think floating to me, I appreciate Ken Wilber's work, but to me floating is a mm -hmm. little bit of a lack of authority, lack of responsibility verb. And I would look at dancing or, mm -hmm. or um, napping. I mean, you go, go sleep it unconscious or do it actively. Otherwise just be still. 
but I don't know the floating floating through. I don't know. I'm maybe I'm a little too much of a stickler on oh verb choice, but the verb choice seems to be congruent with an idea that I think floating feels a little um, a little followy. I guess is the word sheepy. Um, I don't want to be disparaging, but it. Um, I get his point though. I mean, it, yes, we're not limited to one spot. So the ease, ease of movement between. So anyway, Brian. You were... What I would say is I think constellating is something because I think, you know, if we were, if you move far enough, you get enough parallax, same stars, you'll see different constellations. So I guess right. what I'm saying is like, if you float or whatever, pass through in this liquid glass area, I mean, there's, I guess there's fields, there's complexes, there's polarities. And I think that there are ways they can geal into, you know, operation. Yeah, and then yeah. there may be flux and then there's another constellation. I like, so, that's a really good way to put it, especially with the parallax that you can get so far away that you are seeing a different sky. I mm -hmm. mean, in such a way, our different perspective of the same sky, but then that is a different sky. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And Fez says, I found that I was an INTJ four years ago, but it never, I don't know, you, you are what you are, but you still have the opportunities you have. Well, yes. Um, but, the, you know, one question here, always in Jungian psychology is what were you meant to be? And in the end, as Brian will confirm for us, uh, none of this is, is fixed or architecturally formed. It's, you know, in here, all we have is a bunch of liquid something or other that's, that's uh, interacting with, with other liquids, something or other in here. Yeah. And, and uh, we can blab about it all, all we want, but the in here... Um, it says uh, you, you can blab about it all you want. <laughs> you haven't got it yet, guys. <laughs> Something like that. Well, yeah. even with concepts like the book of the body keeps the score, that's one thing too, or that's why action is so important. Instead of, as I say, don't sit around on the couch and smoke the narcotic of hope, wishing. I mean, that's not going to do you any good. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the, that's the literally wishy-washy and it, it will wishy-washy itself right away. You'll never do anything except do nothing, mm -hmm. but getting up and trying. And honestly, I, I find value in the process rather than even the product, because instead of failing, I'm like, no, it's like a road trip. I'm always recalibrating. Hopefully I do my best not to crush my car, mm -hmm. you know? So Brian, you get the last word tonight. <laughs> yep. Well, I guess what I say sometimes, so I think sometimes there are these requirements in like society or roles. So you, you, you want, I think you want an, an, an ST physician making decisions about your care, but you want an NF physician taking care of you at the bedside. Nicely put. So I just yeah. think there's, you know, uh, it's complicated. We have different needs. And I think you could bring strengths through adapting through these polarities and, and, and becoming conscious. So. Right. By becoming conscious of them, it's, it's extremely valuable, um, you know, because I wish that when I was active du in active duty, I, remember, I knew these things, mm -hmm. um, you know, because uh, uh, I could have easily played my career much differently. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and now I do know them so that I, I, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I know that's a I'm good doing. way to put it. I, that's a wonderful way to put it too, because I look back and um, wow, I don't want to change anything because it's my whole life up to this point, but I, over a decade ago and then back, you can kind of be farcical about yourself. You, you go, wow, how didn't I see that? You know? Where's the it's last five years? Hindsight is 2020. Yep. <laughs> but if you keep looking back, you bump into everything moving forward. So 
that's a great comment, Brian, about the, you want the ST um, diag doing the diagnosis in your, in, in medicine, but you, you want the, you know, NF to. Yeah, yeah, I, would, I would say you want the STJ doing medicine. You yeah, want, STA, and then, yeah. Because the a, STP might not get around to doing anything. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the STP might know what has to be done, but then they go, oh, I'm going to go home. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a long day. I'm going to just go home. I'm not going to do this go home, today. Right. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> I'll be back at nine tomorrow morning. If you're just still alive, I'll do it. <laughs> Actually, I have a quick question for Brian. Um, <laughs> so in architecture school, they teach you how to letter and it's, you know, it's, it's military style writing in a way that it becomes, you can do cursive in orthogonal ways. Um, so do they actually teach how to not write well in med school? Um, <laughs> nope, see a that's a thing in the like, past. I always think like, wow, do doctors have to take a scenic writing or something? I mean, yeah. cause it's just like artistic, but it doesn't, it just squiggles. Okay, what did yeah, you say, Brad? The note that's a that's a vestige of the past. Everything is electronic now. It's all typed. Okay. Oh now, wow. You'll have to sign documents, and there is no one that can reproduce my signature. But you know, as an officer, if you had to sign a bunch of forms and orders, your your signature becomes pretty horrific. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because it, yeah, it, yeah. It calligraphizes itself and then reduces to just. You know, the, the motion, yeah, the, the high points of the motion. Yeah, I always <laughs> wanted to have nice cursive writing, and it's only since I took up calligraphy that I started mm -hmm. to get it, and I have to focus on it to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, peace, All gentlemen. Right. Thanks very Thank much you. for being here. See you again, and I suppose you have to work, Brian, but... Yeah, I have a day uh, job during, during the week, so... Uh, Jordan and I will be together on Wednesday at the... At the, well, I'll be at the plaza before hit here. And that. All right.